How's everyone doing tonight? Uh, good. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Maura. I do programs of publicity for the West Rockford Public Library. Um, we're here today to talk about medical cannabis with uh, Dr. Paulina Miklos. And um, just a couple things before we get started. If you didn't already, um, the kiosk is over there to put in your license plate for three free hours of parking. Um, if you could silence your phones, that would be great. Uh, we do have Channel 5 in the back. They are live streaming through YouTube and recording uh, the entire presentation. So just to let you know about that. Um, I'm going to give an introduction to uh, Dr. Paulina, and uh, then I will turn it over to her. Uh, Dr. Paulina Miklos is a doctorally prepared family nurse practitioner with over 10 years of experience in primary care, population health, and advanced diabetes management. She is the owner and medical director of HiMed, a Plainville-based health clinic specializing in cannabis medicine. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Paulina. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Should I stay over here for the presentation? Okay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about medical cannabis, and uh, this will be kind of a brief overview. I'll go into some of the objectives that we'll hit on tonight. But, um, Thank you so much for coming out. I know it's a uh, Wednesday evening, 6 p.m., so we may have some low energy here, but hopefully my talk doesn't put you to sleep. Um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, so as Maura mentioned, I am the um, co-founder and medical director of Higher Med. We are a alternative health practice in downtown Plainville, focusing on cannabis medicine, um, bringing awareness around cannabis medicine to both the general public and medical practitioners. I love doing talks like this and educating both um, the public and healthcare providers about how we can incorporate cannabis medicine into our healthcare practices. Um, this presentation will discuss the use of marijuana for medical purposes. Marijuana is still considered, it's still federally illegal, it is not FDA approved, so all of this is kind of off-label use and, um, and the studies, a lot of the um, kind of criticism against uh, medical marijuana is that there aren't enough studies to support the use of cannabis or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those studies do exist. Uh, primarily, the studies were, were done in other countries because it's extremely difficult to research cannabis in the US being a, um, you know, a Schedule One category substance. And we'll get um, into some of those challenges in just a bit. So uh, some of the objectives and the things we'll talk about tonight 
is um, the basic functions of the endocannabinoid system. It's an organ system in the body. We'll uh, discuss that in, in more detail in just a minute. Um, we'll talk about some of the concerns of using both CBD and THC-containing products, um, safety implications, ethical implications, kind of the legal landscape around medical cannabis in the U.S., and um, we'll talk about how CBD or medical marijuana might be utilized for uh, different healthcare ailments or health ailments. So, I don't know what happened there, why the picture sideways. So I, I made this um, presentation on my map book, and when you bring it over to a Windows, I guess it kind of does its own thing, but that's a picture of um, me and my family, my husband and our two kids. And then um, in the lower corner here, we have our grand opening at Higher Med, um, our, our ribbon cutting, that's me and Alicia, and the, um, heads of the Chamber of Commerce. But a little bit about me, so I um, was born in Poland, moved to the U.S. at nine years old, lived in New Britain, of course, Poland, right? Um, lived in New Britain for, um, for, you know, for my, my teenage years, graduated New Britain High, and then I moved to Boston, went to BC, Boston College, for both my undergrad and master's degree, so I was out there for about seven years, um, and then reluctantly came back to New Britain, married my um, high school sweetheart, and, uh, and now I live in Berlin and practice at um, New Britain General Hospital, or the Hospital of Central Connecticut, um, in advanced diabetes management, and I also opened my practice in cannabis medicine. Um, I have about 10 years of experience as a primary care provider, and now kind of specialized uh, more so in endocrine and diabetes management. I never planned on going into cannabis medicine. It's something that kind of naturally uh, happened over time as I cared for patients with extremely um, challenging and debilitating medical conditions in primary care. I was actually the lead medical provider for the Healthcare for the Homeless program in Central Connecticut for about eight years, and I was at a different shelter every day of the week. Two of those shelters were domestic violence shelters, and during that time I was really exposed to um, how cannabis medicine was able to help folks with conditions that really had not responded to traditional um, kind of pharmaceutical approaches or, or the conventional first-line treatments. Is everything okay with audio? Okay. Um, so, so like I said, I never planned on going into cannabis medicine, but because I saw how much good it was, it was doing for my patients, I um, became one of the pr first prescribers within this large healthcare organization in Connecticut to start prescribe or to start recommending medical cannabis and certifying patients for um, medical cannabis cards. Now, of course, my this large organization which will remain unnamed did not like that so much, and um, and so I, I ended up actually leaving that position to um, to co-found Higher Med with my business associate Alicia, and um, and uh, kind of my background in um, cannabis education because then I really chose to um, delve into a little bit of the science, the research, the um, clinical implications of cannabis. So I studied. Um, under Dr. Dustin Sulak, he's a world-renowned cannabis physician um, out of Maine. He founded Healer, Healer.com. Um, he published a, um, an incredible clinical textbook for, for uh, medical providers around medical cannabis, and I had the pleasure of working with him this January in his clinic in Maine and really observing kind of his protocols for treating various health conditions with cannabis medicine, and, um, and, uh, and I went through his um, Healer Cannabis Training Certification as well. I'm also involved in several um, medical uh, associations that pertain to cannabis medicine. So a little bit about um, the background of cannabis. So it's been around for, this says over 10,000 years, but I actually just was reading a, a research article, article recently um, that cited archaeological evidence showing cannabis use um, for herbal medicine dating back to 500 BC in Eastern Asia. Um, historically, cannabis medicine has been used for relieving pain, for relieving um, stressors. It was widely used in the treatment of gout. It was used for high doses of cannabis were used as um, an anesthetic during surgery. They even used it during childbirth in, in places in, uh, um, in place of things like epidurals that we have um, today. Uh, in, in the um, early to mid 19, uh, 1900s. Uh, cannabis was widely available in the U.S. It was actually one of the most widely prescribed medications and, and part of the U.S. pharmacopoeia. You'd be hard-pressed to find a medicine cabinet in you know, a home in the U.S. that didn't contain some sort of tincture that had um, cannabis oil, cannabis sativa oil, even cough syrups that were derived from cannabis. And um, only in the 1970s was when it was outlawed and deemed a Category 1, um, a Schedule 1 substance, meaning um, so, so, that, so basically what that means is 
cannabis is in a category that places it as, as or, or um, categorizes it as something more dangerous than cocaine and meth. Um, it basically, the, the um, US Pharmacopeia now states that cannabis is extremely addictive and has no medical potential or no medical benefits whatsoever, which is contradictory because uh, we have 46 states that now have medical cannabis programs, right? So kind of it doesn't make sense, but um, that's, that's kind of where we are today. And um, the, the reason that cannabis was outlawed in the 1970s and in the years prior to that is really um, a little controversial, I would say, but a lot of um, the roots behind that have to do with the war on drugs, the, um, it really those roots, um, are, or that, that whole movement is rooted in um, a lot of racial and kind of discriminatory um, behavior towards Mexican, Amer um, towards, me towards Mexican immigrants and African American um, uh, immigrants that, um, that came over around that time period. And um, because they were, um, commonly using marijuana um, and, and uh, the, the um, Caucasian kind of population was concerned about marijuana use increasing in, among its own uh, population. And so for that reason, um, they outlawed marijuana, not realizing that the cannabis oil in their medicine cabinet was the very drug that they were outlawing, that they were you know, the exact same substance. Um, so this is just a timeline of uh, some of what, what I talked about today. Um, when we look at kind of the more more recent um, discoveries or, or advances in cannabis medicine and, and cannabis science in general, in the 1990s, an Israeli um, uh, neuroscientist discovered the endocannabinoid system, which I'll get into that, but he actually, in the process of, of researching the potential negative side effects of cannabis, um, they discovered how cannabis actually works in the body and what receptors it binds to and how it has the potential to, um, to target organ systems and, and really help with so many seemingly unrelated conditions. And so they were, they were doing this research with the intent of kind of finding the harms of cannabis and conversely what they identified was this widespread system in our body that's actually primed to receive cannabis medicine and, and um, theoretically restore our um, homeostasis or, or kind of the balance in our body as it pertains to the endocannabinoid system. And we'll get into that in just a minute. So here, this is the, uh, the current uh, US kind of um, cannabis legalization landscape. So as you can see here, there are only four states, four orange states there, that um, in which cannabis is fully illegal. Um, many other states have um, you know, medical programs and, and cannabis is decriminalized, some have only medical programs, most states, um, or, or uh, all, all of the states on here, other than the four orange states, do um, allow for CBD use. Um, and, and then the, the states that have medical or um, medical and decriminalized status allow for THC use as well. So um, cannabis, like I mentioned, was, uh, was a, plant, uh, a flowering plant that originated in Asia and India. Um, the two strains, or the two kind of, um, the, the two families, I guess, or categories that can, the cannabis plant is then divided into, or subdivided into, are, is the uh, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show you a little bit about um, the structural differences of those two plants and how they have different effects. Um, besides that, an important thing to know is the cannabinoids that are contained in cannabis. So those are compounds that actually make up the cannabis plant. And scientists have now identified over 200 of these different components that make up the plant. And so the two most common ones that you may have heard of or, um, or that are popular kind of in, in mainstream media are CBD, cannabidiol, and then THC, which is um, tetrahydrocannabinol. So the THC, um, molecule or the THC portion of the cannabis plant is what's responsible for more of the psychoactive effect. So when you think of that kind of head high that people tend to get when they consume cannabis or smoke cannabis, that is, um, that is the action of THC on the body. Whereas CBD does not have those same psychoactive effects. You would have to ingest or use an insanely high amount of CBD, something that's like, you know, impossible to ingest in one sitting in order to have any, any real psychoactive effect from CBD alone. Um, with that being said, CBD, um, while it has many benefits, it oftentimes 
requires just a touch of CBD to, to or I mean, it requires just a touch of the THC in order to kind of potentiate its full effect. So CBD alone, um, especially uh, broad spectrum CBD, meaning CBD where all of the THC has been completely isolated, it's THC free, um, <coughs> oftentimes will not necessarily do the job or get you the full effect that you're looking for because oftentimes it needs just that little bit of THC and it's, it's, it really can be a negligible amount, not something that causes any psychoactive effect, but just the, um, the, the full spectrum product so that it hasn't kind of um, been messed with and, and um, the, the active compound hasn't been, haven't been removed yet. Um, so like I said, THC, CBD, those are the two most common. Some of the, um, a few of the minor cannabinoids that, that really have been uh, more popular lately include um, cannabigerol, CBG, so that is, um, it's a precursor to CBD, and uh, it's, it, right now we're looking at the role of CBG in treating um, gut disorders and, and um, intestinal issues, so things like ulcerative colitis, IBS, IBD, um, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, because CBG acts on the gut lining to actually decrease inflammation to the intestinal tract. It's, um, it's showing some great promise in helping um, calm down the symptoms of these inflammatory kind of gut um, conditions. Um, cannabinerol is another one, so that's CBN, and, um, and right now um, that's actually being studied for sleep, and uh, it's proving to be somewhat more effective than melatonin in helping um, sleep, in, in helping uh, patients to both fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, and, and the CBN doesn't have that same kind of uh, psychoactive effect that the THC would. It, it causes very little of that kind of residual effect. So sometimes with THC, if you take too high of a dose before bedtime, you wake up in the morning groggy, it's kind of that, that THC is still being metabolized. It's still affecting your cognition. You feel almost this like weed hangover, right? Um, that doesn't happen with cannabinerol because it's essentially just a sister molecule to, to CBD. And while I don't love that classification, I think we will be moving away from that kind of categorization over the next five to 10 years. Right now, this is what we've got, so this is kind of what I um, explain to folks. The, um, so the sativa um, dominant cannabis strains, the leaves are taller, slimmer, and they have a much different effect than indica-based strains. So sativa, um, you, you think sativa as stimulating, um, energizing, it's kind of better for uh, for daytime use, I would say. Still, of course, will because it's THC, can cause some impairment, but it's it's not something that will necessarily put you to sleep. Indica is, is um, you know, indica in the couch. I, I think it's so corny and I hate myself every time I say it, but it, it at least helps it kind of stick in your mind. Um, and so indica is, is um, kind of the, uh, the, the strain or, or the family of cannabis that is more sedating, relaxing, it's good to use um, at the end of the day to help you kind of wind down, fall asleep, but it's not, it's not um, something that you want to use in the morning. Hybrid just basically means it's somewhere on the spectrum, it's, it's a combination of both. So um, why I said I don't necessarily love this classification is over, uh, over so many years, the cannabis plant has been crossbred so many times with so many different strains that something that is labeled an indica, you think, okay, I'm gonna use this to, you know, to fall asleep, it's gonna help you relax at the end of the day, but you use it and then all of a sudden you're alert, you're anxious, you're overthinking your life decisions in bed, right? And so even though it was labeled an indica, it's acting more like a sativa because over time that indica named plant has been crossbred with sativa plants you know, um, so many times that now it has more of a profile of like a sativa. And so that's where um, it really helps to have the guidance of a health professional who's familiar with cannabis or a pharmacist who's familiar with kind of the, the minor cannabinoids, the terpenes and, and all of the things that make up the cannabis plant because, because going based off of just, I'm gonna buy this indica product that's gonna help me sleep might actually not work that way for you. It's, it's better to look at the terpenes, the, um, the minor cannabinoids, the different little letters that I told you about, the CBD, CBN, CBG, um, looking at that really helps put a more systematic approach to choosing your cannabis medicine when you're at the dispensary. Um, time and time again, Alicia and I see patients come in who you know, were previously certified by other medical providers. Some of them have had their card for years. I saw someone today who initially was certified for his card in 2014. 
It's now 2023, nine years later, and he still has no idea how he's picking his cannabis medicine. He goes to the dispensary and buys, you know, whatever's on sale, whatever looks good this week. And it's, I could not think of a, of a more, like, of a worse waste of money, right? You're just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. But really, there is a much more scientific process to it. It's just you need to be familiar with the terpene breakdown. What you know? What are the terpenes doing? What effects do they have? What percentage of terpenes are dominant in this product versus this one? Um, and so we had a long conversation about that, and he was like, "Oh my God, I had my card for ten years, and no one's ever talked to me about this." Um, and I think I. I I both hate and love hearing that. It tells me that like we're doing a good job in, in the services that we're providing, but it just pains me to think this person has been spending so much money at the dispensary for a decade now and still not getting out of his regimen what he, you know, what he wanted to, to get essentially. Question? Yes. Um, when you're going in and purchasing things, you're purchasing plants or leaves or flowers or whatever. But when you talk about these 200 products and these other labels, they're somehow being extracted from the plants to do research in it. Am I correct or am I wrong? You know, how can you talk and say that this TEG is what's doing something when you're not sure if they're getting just that or if they're getting a whole mishmash? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So in, in the research, um, why I say that, you know, the scientists are looking at, for example, CBG specifically for this, for these conditions, or CBN for insomnia, is they were able to isolate those substances from the cannabis plant, and in those studies, they're essentially giving patients a form of pure CBG. So when you go into the dispensary, um, you, you'll have you have a selection to a variety of products. You're not just buying leaves and flour. There are you know pills, tinctures, gummies, um, lots of different formulations that basically will say you know this is a CBG tincture. The dominant cannabinoid in this tincture is CBG. So if you're looking for something for gut inflammation, you are looking for a product that has CBG as the as the main you know cannabinoid in it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so in any clinical study, when they are testing a, a, a compound, they do provide the, the label, the ingredients, the, um, every, every product, both at the dispensary and every product that's, that's tested in the clinical studies has been third-party tested by a laboratory that's completely separate from any, you know, they, they have no affiliations in the cannabis industry and they're just, they're testing for potency, they're testing for um, any toxic compounds, they're testing to make sure that this product does in fact, you know, contain this amount of CBG or this amount of CBN. And so that's what we're testing. Um, I'm going to proceed, so we're going to save the um, Q&As for, for later, actually. Um, so once I'm done with the presentation, you'll have plenty of time to ask all the questions you'd like. So if you want to um, just jot them down or kind of keep them in your mind, um, that would be wonderful. So um, so why why is this conversation relevant? How is you know um, cannabis relevant to healthcare in general? Um, so as part of our you know nursing school training, medical school training, physical therapy, any of these kind of um, healthcare related sciences, we learn about the various um, bodily systems, the respiratory system, the endocrine system, the muscular system. But only 13% of um, health related grad programs actually teach students about. Um, about the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is a vast network of cells that basically communicates to, um, to upregulate and downregulate a variety of different responses in the body, including uh, inflammation, including your immune response. Um, I'll get into um, the specifics a little more here. So uh, like I said, it's a cell signaling system identified in the 1990s by a um, Israeli neuroscientist named Raphael Meshulam, who actually just passed away at the age of 90 um, a few months ago. And he's kind of the, um, the father of cannabis science, I would say. Um, so, like I said, in the early 1990s is when THC was discovered. 1991, I believe, the endocannabinoid system was discovered. So this system has been around now for over 30 years, and still it is not um, being widely taught in 
you know, uh, medical schools or, or nursing programs, despite the fact that the endocannabinoid system, these, these uh, cells, these CB1 receptor cells, CB2 receptor cells, are found in every single organ system in our body. It's more widespread than the endocrine system even. Um, and it's present in all vertebrae species. So regardless of whether you've ever even ever seen cannabis, smelled cannabis, been in the presence of cannabis, you have an endocannabinoid system in your body, which basically means your body is producing compounds that are almost identical to that of the cannabis plant, and those compounds are responsible for regulating um, inflammation in your body, for helping with your mood, for helping with um, satiety symptoms, how, or satiety um, signals, so how hungry or how full you are, um, it's, it plays a key role in your immune system response. So one of the theories is um, if when your endocannabinoid system or endocannabinoid to tone is really low, your immune system is weaker and you're more prone to, to kind of diseases and inflammatory conditions. Um, Let's see, this is a little more about um, how the receptors work. So it's almost like a lock and key. So the receptor is primed to receive whatever um, cannabinoid is, um, is kind of present in the body. So these receptors over time as our own cannabinoids, our own, if you think of cannabinoids like um, almost, almost like endorphins, for example, when you go running or you exercise, your body releases these feel good endorphins. Now, um, even that is postulated to also uh, include a lot of um, endocannabinoid release in your body as well. Nothing to do with cannabis, it's just as you're exercising, endorphins are being released and endocannabinoids are being released as well. And that's what's kind of responsible for that, like runner's high, the good feeling, the, the feeling that you get after a good workout. And so um, similarly to, to, to that kind of concept, cannabinoids in your body, you know, once they're, they're um, released, uh, the, the receptors are primed to kind of receive those, um, those cannabinoids that, like I said, can, can um, play a big role in mood, um, immune system function. Um, let's see, the CB1 receptor. So, so these receptors are mostly found in the central nervous system or along kind of the center part of, of um, the body and, and brain. So brain, central nervous system, the, these are the receptors that THC binds to. So um, CBD binds more so to CB2 receptors, and those are not as, um, they're not as involved in like the psychoactive effect. So when you ingest CBD, it, it binds more so to the receptors in your extremities, whereas THC binds more to the receptors in your brain and your central nervous system. Um, so one of the theories that I touched on uh, by Dr. Ethan Rousseau, he is a um, neurologist and, uh, and the director of research and development um, at the um, International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute. Um, one of his theories that has now been studied extensively, this is something that he theorized in the 90s, um, is that clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, meaning a, a dysregulation of your endocannabinoid system, can, um, is thought to be at the root of many chronic conditions that we face. So for example, fibromyalgia. Um, conventional medicine, pharmaceuticals, really don't offer much in terms of relieving symptoms of fibromyalgia or really kind of helping get to the root cause of fibromyalgia or treating that root cause. And um, what's, what's kind of being um, looked into now is um, Level, they're, they're looking at um, levels of cannabinoids or, or our own cannabinoids in the body in people who have conditions like you know, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia in comparison to people who don't. And they're finding that the levels um, of these cannabinoids in our body, not cannabis related, but just our own producing cannabinoids, are lower in folks that have these inflammatory conditions or these autoimmune disorders versus people who don't. And so by the theory is that by repleting these kind of deficiencies, we can bring the body into a, a, st a state of homeostasis or balance and really relieve some of those symptoms. Um, this is similar to, you know, if you think of the endocrine system and, um, and for example, uh, with hypothyroidism, right, we have a deficiency in thyroid hormone. And so to, um, and, and, and that wreaks havoc on our bodies. Uh, symptoms of hypothyroidism, you know, low energy, constipation, feeling cold all the time, that is due to a deficiency in thyroid hormone. We replace the thyroid hormone by taking Synthroid or taking oral thyroid medications. Similarly, um, you know, the, the, what's, what's theorized is low levels of these various cannabinoids, which like I said, there are hundreds, um, low levels of these, of these um, low levels of these cannabinoids are likely behind a lot of the chronic inflammatory conditions that, that folks are facing these days. And I think that's, 
that speaks volumes to why so many seemingly unrelated conditions respond well to treatment with cannabis medicine. Um, so I, I realize this may be hard to read, but these are the um, conditions that qualify and somehow the present the uh, list that cut off here, but this is, I think this is just the first column of the conditions that qualify in Connecticut for a medical cannabis card. Um, and so right now I believe there are 40 or 41 conditions in Connecticut that qualify. Um, some of the most common conditions that we see in our clinic have to do with pain or chronic pain. And I think, um, you know, in, uh, in a prior presentation that I did, um, I think at a different library, I had this slide, and then in the next slide, I highlighted all the conditions that have to do with pain, and I think more than like 70% of the conditions on the qualifying list are actually chronic pain conditions. So, um, for example, you know, disc disease, um, neuropathy, um, let's see, you know, even some of, the, uh, some of the gut disorders, like I said, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, um, wasting syndrome, which is basically like a, um, an, an anorexia or, um, or severe weight loss due to, um, you know, um, an immune deficiency, HIV, cancer, um, all of these conditions qualify. But many people don't realize that, um, that most likely if you're dealing with a chronic pain, you probably qualify for a medical card under kind of the, the guidelines that the state, the, the Connecticut uh, Medical Marijuana Program set forth. So what they kind of consider a chronic pain diagnosis is um, pain that's lasted for six months or more with abnormal imaging or documentation to support that this patient has tried kind of the conventional treatment. So for example, if someone has chronic low back pain, they get an x-ray, it's showing, you know, mild arthritis or maybe a herniated disc, something along those lines. They've tried physical therapy and that hasn't, you know, hasn't helped significantly. They're still dealing with that pain. That in itself is enough to apply for a medical cannabis card. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I'm happy to take questions about other kind of qualifying conditions or if you have specific questions around that afterwards. Yes. Yes, yes, good point, yep. Okay, um, so um, some of the uh, more exciting kind of newer research that we're seeing is um, how promising cannabis, medical cannabis can be for treating um, the symptoms involved in neurological disorders, so spasticity and movement disorders. Um, right now they're kind of looking at um, using medical cannabis as treatment for ALS which um, unfortunately is, is a very, is a, is a debilitating and, and terminal condition um, for which we really have had no medical advances or, or real kind of promising um, um, treatments over the last several decades. And so it's, it's exciting to see that, so basically these were pre, um, preclinical studies, meaning they were, they were done on animal models, but um, they found that administering high-dose um, cannabis medicine to these rats that had ALS actually helped to um, both delay and reverse some of, the, um, some of the kind of symptoms or progression of ALS plaques. Um, so that is that as far as, um, you know, various neurological and, and movement disorders. Um, chronic pain. So chronic pain is, um, this, is the, uh, this is kind of the, the most common reason that folks come to medical cannabis. Oftentimes, um, I, I can't even tell you how often we have um, kind of folks that are, that are uh, maybe a little more elderly and, and reluctant to come to, to, to see us and, and even discuss medical cannabis and they're kind of dragged there by their son or daughter who is just fed up with the fact that, you know, they've, they've been trying all these medications, they've been on, you know, maybe prescription pain medications or, or other meds that have failed them, and so now this, I have this elderly person sitting in front of me like, I don't want to be here, my daughter brought me here, you know, I don't believe in this at all, this is not FDA approved, and I have to kind of, um, you know, explain to them how it works in the body. Oftentimes we don't start with anything THC containing at all, I will just suggest something you know, with CBD or suggest something like a topical cannabis product or salve, something to just um, kind of dip their toe in the water, so to speak, and, and get them feeling a little more comfortable around cannabis medicine. I think, um, A, because uh, cannabis has such a negative stigma from years of you know, propaganda and, and kind of um, uh, 
outlawing due to racial circumstances, and, um, and I understand even that is, is a debatable subject, but I think because cannabis is rather controversial, oftentimes people kind of come to cannabis as, a, as an ultimate last resort, and, uh, and I think that's unfortunate in many ways because sometimes we'll see patients who um, are like in the terminal stages of, of cancer and they've suffered through you know months and months of chemotherapy and radiation and all these treatments during which they they were never even made aware that cannabis is an option to help them with some of these um, side effects or or uh, potential kind of um, symptoms that they're having from their treatment or symptoms from the cancer itself um, and so I think rather than using it as kind of the last ditch option, um, offering it to patients earlier on in their course could be beneficial. I'm not saying it should be a first line treatment for, for everything. It's not a cure all. Um, it's not a miracle drug, despite you know other despite some people touting it as that. But I do think um, it's we're doing a disservice to our patients by not learning more about how it works in the body and learning kind of how we can incorporate it into our um, treatment of various conditions. Um, so here's a little bit about kind of um, the methods of consumption and how we can use cannabis. As a medical provider, I very rarely, um, if ever, recommend smoking cannabis. Um, and, and I think that's kind of something that oftentimes is off-putting to, to people, like even even considering cannabis, I still get people saying, you know, I'm not going to smoke a joint when I, when I suggest something like medical cannabis. And I say, I don't want you to smoke a joint. I, I, you know, I never want you to put a foreign substance into your lungs. Um, their cannabis medicine has really come so far and we have um, cannabis containing pills and uh, capsules and you know edible products, gummies, tinctures, which are like oil-based extracts that, um, that are, are rather potent. Um, there's transdermal or, or topical formulations as well, including like pain creams, pain patches. There's suppositories. I mean, we have so many different options in terms of how to dose cannabis medicine. And, and I think in terms of looking at it as a medicine, we need to legitimize cannabis medicine by making it as consistent as our, you know, as simple as taking a cholesterol medicine that's 10 milligrams, you can also have a capsule that's, you know, 2 milligrams THC, 5 milligrams CBD, and you know it's going to be that same concentration every single time, versus when it comes to smoking, it's much more difficult to be consistent with, with the dosing and the regimen, you know, you even even the, the vape pens and all that, you see people sucking on them like a straw. Uh, they're, they're walking around with the vape pen hanging out of their mouth and it's, it's very hard to quantify, like how many milligrams of THC are you getting by inhaling the substance? Did you take one puff? Did you take two? Was this puff deeper than the one that you took last night to fall asleep? You know, it's very hard to be consistent with the dosing and, and kind of be more um, systematic about it in a medical approach um, when you're just using inhaled cannabis. Um, so some of the side effects of cannabis, you know, like I said, it can it can work for um, relieving or or kind of um, decreasing symptoms for many seemingly unrelated conditions, but it can have its downsides as well. One of the biggest um, kind of um, I would say um, objections to cannabis use is the fact that in in people who have a history of mental health disorders, primarily um, history of psychosis, hearing and or hearing or seeing things that aren't there, um, or if you have a strong family predisposition to something like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, you really have to heed caution or or maybe even abstain from THC containing products because. Um, those products, especially in high concentrations or frequent use, can um, increase your chances of developing that mental health disorder. Um, and, and especially if someone is predisposed to like paranoia or, um, or finds that you know, when they've used cannabis previously or let's say they try it now for pain, they, they kind of are having these symptoms of psychosis, hearing things, seeing things that aren't there, I would you know, recommend that they stop immediately because that can kind of continue to escalate and, and bring about this psychosis. Now, using cannabis in itself does not increase your risk of developing schizophrenia or bipolar disorder if you don't have that predisposition already, if you don't have that, you know, um, that kind of uh, uh, either family history or personal history. 
With that being said, these are, these are some of the more common side effects that people tend to experience. So cannabis can cause um, sedation or fatigue, which can be a good or bad thing. If you, if you have insomnia and you're wanting to use it to fall asleep, obviously that's a good thing. But if you're using it primarily for, you know, let's say pain management or PTSD symptoms and you're taking it during the day, you don't necessarily want something that's going to, you know, put you to sleep or, or have you feeling really tired all day. Um, cannabis can cause some dizziness. Um, that's kind of because of its effect on the... Um, the periphery, the vasculature, so basically it's, it's affecting the circulation. It can increase the heart rate a little bit, and, um, and it can actually decrease the blood pressure a tiny bit. So people who tend to have hypotension or low blood pressure, I will actually have them monitor their blood pressure for the first week or two when they're starting out their cannabis medicine, um, just to make sure that they're not experiencing more dizziness as a result of that blood pressure decrease. And it's very mild. It's maybe like five points systolic, the top top blood pressure number that may um, be reduced, but, uh, but I always kind of have people watch for that. Um, some of the more common symptoms, obviously, you know, the dry eyes, red eyes, kind of eye irritation, increased hunger and thirst, um, so, you know, the munchies or cotton mouth, as we commonly refer to them. Um, uh, let's see, it can, it can certainly cause anxiety and paranoia in some folks. And so especially, like I said, if you're predisposed to, to anxiety or if you've had kind of these paranoid episodes in the past when you've used cannabis, A, it may be that you used something that was very sativa dominant or very kind of, you know, stimulating. Um, the, the other thing, too, is it also depends on the quantity. So... If you are having some of these side effects, it may just be that your dose was way too high. Um, how, we, how we typically dose things, especially for folks that are really new to cannabis or, or you know, have never really explored it as a, as a medication option, I would start at a very low dose, like 0 0.5 milligrams of THC, um, increasing that to one milligram over time. I think the problem, uh, what we're seeing a lot of now, now that it's, it's recreationally available, is people are, go people are going to the dispensary, buying a pack of gummies that are five milligrams each, you know, taking a couple in one sitting, and then all of a sudden they're melting into their couch for the evening. Um, or they're, you know, feeling really anxious and going to the ER because they think the world is ending. Now, this, this doesn't happen very often, but we have seen these, these types of clinical presentations since, you know, cannabis has been made recreationally available in Connecticut. And that's kind of where I really think especially people who are new to cannabis, especially people who are on other medications on a daily basis, starting something like cannabis, even if you're getting it on the recreational side, really should be done under the guidance of a medical professional. Um, some safety precautions. So I, I um, touched on this a little bit, but um, cannabis is uh, very well tolerated in most individuals. So unlike, you know, opioid um, medications or benzodiazepines, things like Xanax, Valium, um, cannabis does not directly impact the opioid um, receptors in the body and it doesn't cause a down regulation of like your, your respiratory um, response. So it's not ever going to halt your breathing. It's not going to stop your heart. We, we see this happen in overdose uh, with opioids, with benzos, especially mixing those types of medications with alcohol. Um, you know, it can, it can lead to over, overdose and death. In order to overdose from cannabis, you would have to smoke. I think it's two tons worth of cannabis in a matter of 18 minutes. I don't know how they, you know, how they came to that figure or whoever put that to the test, but this is what I read in a, in a medical journal, so I'll just, you know, um, quote that. Um, but the, the risk of dependence with cannabis is relatively low as well. I find that um, really the um, kind of your, your risk for dependence or addiction to cannabis really depends on the dose and frequency of use. And that's where I really think um, helping folks understand and, and have kind of a good understanding of uh, how often to use the cannabis, how long the effects last for, um, how does you know smoking cannabis differ from taking an oral product, all of that um, is something that should be part of the conversation in helping come up with a good regimen and titrating up very slowly. So in medicine, in general, any medication that we prescribe, typically we, we use the adage, um, you know, start low, go slow. 
and that cannot be more true when it comes to medical cannabis. We start, or my clinic at the very least, we start at a very, very low dose, and we only increase every maybe you know three to five days. It's not like take one gummy today, take two tomorrow, take three the next day. Although unfortunately, some of my patients still you know do that and don't heed my advice. Um, but but at the very least, you know I, I think making sure that folks have that guidance so that we see less of these adverse effects and. and you know, ER visits related to irresponsible cannabis use that really is not so much um, the fault of the consumer, it's more so the public, the lack of like public health awareness and public health education. I think since recreational has um, come into the market, we really haven't done a, um, a good enough job of educating the public about kind of how to safely use cannabis, especially in the setting of these chronic medical conditions and maybe their, the medications that they're on. Um, so, and that goes right into, you know, drug-drug interactions. So because cannabis is metabolized by um, a, a pathway in the liver that many other medications are also metabolized by, in theory, taking cannabis um, together with some of these meds can cause levels of these medications to build up in the bloodstream. Where that can be, um, you know, very dangerous is things like um, blood thinners, particularly those where we have to check the INR, Coumadin, Warfarin. If you're on these medications, I don't recommend starting cannabis unless it's been cleared by your cardiologist. You know, I've consulted with your cardiologist. We're looking at your INR before you're starting the cannabis regimen, maybe, you know, a couple days into starting it. Um, we're checking it on a weekly basis just to make sure that, you know, there's no increased or decreased risk of um, coagulation <laughs> Um, with the Coumadin or Warfarin use along with cannabis. Same thing with, um, with um, antipsychotics or, or various um, psych medications, um, beta blockers, opi opioids. Um, a lot of these medications that are, that are metabolized by the CYP450 um, pathway in the liver will, uh, in theory, kind of um, can, can interact with cannabis. Now, I have not personally seen this in practice. We've now certified um, around maybe 250 patients over the last two years. And um, a handful of those patients were on blood thinners and like with, with our kind of close guidance, um, we've never had an issue. Um, so, but I am very cautious about this and oftentimes we'll get um, you know, the specialist or the primary care team involved just so that we know that the patient is using this safely. Um, as far as contraindications or kind of wh when cannabis would not be appropriate or not good, um, Anyone with a history of psychotic disorders, like I said, schizophrenia, bipolar, seeing or hearing things that aren't there, I, I would not recommend using THC. I think um, CBD would be probably okay in that case, and even that I would kind of, um, you know, want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on things. Um, oftentimes, if someone does have a history of, of, you know, maybe a remote psychotic episode that was related to, to something, you know, let's say uh, drug use, cocaine use, something like that, or... Um, or uh, someone has a history of substance abuse, will get their behavioral health team, their psychologist or psychiatrist involved as well to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then uh, severe cardiovascular, kidney and liver disease, those are also, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily contraindications, but I, I always like to get the specialists involved and get clearance from, uh, from one specialist team to, to make sure that the patient is okay to proceed with the cannabis regimen. Um, so, and this is the process for obtaining a medical card in Connecticut. You would meet with a, a medical provider who specializes in cannabis medicine um, or, or is willing to do the certification. Those visits um, are typically between $150 to $300, depending on kind of where you go. Um, if that medical provider deems uh, that it is appropriate for you to be issued a medical cannabis card, then they would start the application process with you and, um, and get you hopefully set up with your local dispensary, which um, similarly to like a local pharmacy, it's, it's essentially a pharmacy for cannabis only. And so um, you, you would then, uh, once you receive your medical cannabis card, you would then actually have a consultation with the pharmacist there at the dispensary as well. And they would give you specific recommendations around the products that they have in their inventory based on kind of your, your health conditions and what symptoms you're hoping to treat or, or relieve with the cannabis medicine. Um, and I think that's that. And then the, the medical card does have to be renewed um, on an annual basis. So every year you would touch base with that medical provider to make sure that you are, you know, using the cannabis medicine appropriately, that it's still working for you, that you're getting out of the, the regimen what you had hoped. What else?
else do I have here? So here's um, a little bit about our clinic. So we're located in downtown Plainville. That's kind of our, our front office, our entryway. And um, yeah, and I think that's that. I have, this is just a picture of the THC versus CBD leaves and the, the, um, the molecular, molecular structure of both, very similar. Um, these are the terpenes, so this is a little more advanced kind of cannabis stuff, but I want to save time for questions, so we'll just move through that, and then some of my references. Um, so I'd love to open up the floor for questions. Sure, gentleman in the front. Uh, so a couple of quick things and questions. Mm -hmm. Number one, thank you for an excellent speaker. Thank one. you. Number two, as you mentioned about overdosing, you have to do two, uh, you have to do two times. Two tons in 18 minutes. I did that when I was 20 years old. <laughs> and here you are, <laughs> sitting with us today. <laughs> uh, anyway, serious and serious about the question. So the, the medical provider, certified medical, is not your regular doctor. And number two is tell yeah. me about any insurances that do or don't cover the Yeah. Excellent questions. Yeah, those are some of the most common uh, questions that we get, and um, and I'll repeat them. So, first question was, um, can my primary care provider, or is is you know the certifying medical provider, is that going to be the same person as you know my primary care doctor or my specialist? Second question was. Um, insurance. Insurances, right? Insurance coverage for medical cannabis. So, so. Uh, as far as the first question goes, some medical providers, some primary care providers or, or specialists are open to, to certifying their patients for medical cannabis. Um, sometimes it really comes down to the healthcare system that they're employed by, unfortunately. And so um, I was just talking to someone this morning who, who said, you know, my, my primary care provider is at blank physicians, you know, they're at part of this big medical group, and she believes in medical cannabis, and she would absolutely certify me, but this company has this big anti-cannabis policy, and so she can't do it, so I'm coming to you, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's that's one thing. And then as far as the, um, but I, I always um, tell folks, you know, if it could save you a couple bucks, I absolutely recommend that you ask your primary care provider, because you'd be surprised, especially if they're in private practice or if they're not affiliated with some of these larger groups. Many medical providers are willing to, to certify folks. A lot of them are on board with medical cannabis. Some just don't know enough about it. I, I would say most medical providers haven't really like delved into this as a science, as a research, to feel comfortable recommending it. Because most medical providers, they do recognize the, the fact that there, there are benefits to using cannabis, but because they don't know like how it works in the body, how it plays with the other medications the person's on, they're not willing to take that risk of certifying the patient <coughs> because they don't know enough about it. Yes, sir. Oh, insurance. I'll get to that. I have to congratulate you because you've given a, a marvelous presentation and an enormous amount of material Thank to you, someone sir. who had zero knowledge about cannabis in our walk into this room. It's a very impressive presentation. And I, I think we all appreciate what you've done. Thank you. However, you do present sort of a wild west the use of this drug, mm. which is a very valuable health care drug that has been totally unresearched by the pharmaceutical companies who've resisted dealing with this. You've listed almost every ailment known to man <laughs> that it can help. And doctors are prescribing drugs for these things for the last hundred years. Mm. Yet this particular plan with all its species and variations and combinations has potential, but it's enormously complex. Mm -hmm. It's like a whole pharmacopoeia in this one plan. My question is, why have the drug companies steered clear of this thing for 50 years? Is it, is it not profitable? Is it too confusing? Has it been politicized? Has it been... Uh, what, what, how can you explain this? Because it yeah. was illegal, but it's been legalized in places now, so it was the answer. Yeah. Why don't you tell me the answer? Yeah. Um, so the question is kind of why Big Pharma has yet to um, explore cannabis medicine. Um, and, and I think the, the answer, the, the response to that is really multifaceted. Um, Big Pharma spends millions of dollars each year lobbying against cannabis legalization because they stand to lose 
billions in the first year that it's, that it's legalized. I have single-handedly how this can um, decrease a lot of pharmaceutical use. And, and so obviously this is happening you know, across the board for, for many medical cannabis uh, clinicians that are seeing this firsthand. Um, and, and so I think cannabis in general is a big threat to, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason why uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry has yet to really invest a lot of money and, and time into researching it is A, because it's federally illegal and a, a Schedule I substance. Um, I've, I've read that it takes seven years from the time that you propose a research study that contains cannabis. It takes seven years from that time that you submit the application to actually receive permission and receive the cannabis product. And right now in the U.S., you can only use cannabis products that are grown, produced by, and, and, uh, and distributed by, I believe it's the University of Missouri. Um, and, and so in order to, because like I said, it's a Schedule One substance. And, um, and so it's, it makes it very, very difficult for the U.S. to um, you know, conduct any of these research studies. The other thing too is in a lot of these studies where they've isolated compounds of the cannabis plant to see how, you know, how this one terpene or this one uh, cannabinoid will work on, let's say, a, a pain condition or something like that. They found that by isolating it and putting it into a pill, it's not nearly as effective as using a full spectrum product, like the actual cannabis plant. And so because it's that hard to synthesize and, and you know and, and kind of encapsulate and put into pill form and have it have the same effect. Um, big pharma really, um, you know, that that poses a big challenge to big pharma. So then the logical follow through from this is uh, another very good explanation, incidentally. Uh, how can you possibly ask for an opinion from a physician who's tied in with big pharma? whether one of these cannabis products is going to be harmful or not. I mean, the thing is, I, I don't think saying that physicians are tied in with big pharma isn't necessarily accurate. You know, um, I think healthcare systems maybe sometimes, uh, or, or I guess it's, it's a very complicated uh, response there, but um, I, I don't personally know many physicians who are tied in with, with big pharma, some of them do speak on on you know different you know they're affiliated with Lilly or or Novo or or some of these like you know Merck or some of these larger uh, big pharma corporations. But I I don't necessarily I think that at the bottom of it you know or, or at the very root of it we really aim <coughs> we aim to do no harm. We want to do what's best for our patient, and it really I think um, is a disservice if we're if we continue only prescribing and only recommending pharmaceutical medications, even when the patient has um, tried and failed these different therapies. Or let's say they're on these medications that are, are now harmful to their liver or harmful to their kidneys, and we have something that's, that you know, is not nearly as harmful and can show really great benefit. Um, I, I, many, many physicians are getting on board with cannabis. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so cannabis, uh, like I said, um, I, I did mention that, you know, um, when ingesting cannabis, especially in, uh, in very frequent use or, or high concentration, so for example, the vaping products, vape, vapes are essentially um, oils or extracts of cannabis or, or, um, or kind of hash that has been boiled down to these little oils in the vape cartridges that people are smoking. Those are very concentrated products, and if you're using those very concentrated cannabis products, your body, it, it's not that it develops um, a similar dependency to, to opioids where, you know, um, where you have these excruciating pains and, and um, this, this really kind of uh, severe presentation, but I have seen in some patients, especially the, the handful of patients that we've seen who have come in um, with these withdrawal symptoms because, uh, because of very heavy use, was basically a, a result of a very unhealthy relationship with cannabis where they are going through, you know, a typical vape cartridge usually will last someone at least two weeks if they're, if they're smoking it, you know, several times a day. I, I saw a patient um, a couple weeks ago who was going through one vape cartridge per day, meaning she was just, you know, 
smoking this day in, day out. And so when she tried to quit cold turkey, she felt irritated. She felt nauseous. Um, you know, it's, it's not nearly the same withdrawal kind of syndrome that we see with opioids or with benzos where you have increased risk of seizures or anything like that. But, um, but it can be quite uncomfortable. As far as the addiction potential, it is relatively low if you're using it under the guidance of a medical professional and you're, you're using it at very low doses. Yes? I know the answer, but can you just answer the question about the insurance thing? Yes, absolutely. And also, do you see a difference um, now that marijuana can um, the recreational marijuana is becoming more and more popular in the amount of people going for the certification for the medical marijuana? And what are the advantages, if you're appropriate for medical marijuana, to continue to go for it? There more options, mm -hmm. choices, um, higher doses? Yeah. Great question, great question. So um, so one of the questions was, have I seen a change in the patterns of uh, people coming in for medical cards or not, um, you know, since uh, recreational cannabis has been made available um, in Connecticut as of January? And, um, and I, I certainly have, and our practice has definitely seen a little bit of a decrease in, in patients' kind of uh, interest in getting their, their medical cards. Um, where, where I still think there's a huge advantage to having your medical card is, A, you have the guidance of a medical provider, you have the, um, the supervision and guidance of a pharmacist in the dispensary who's helping, um, you know, helping look at any medications that you're on. Are there drug-drug interactions with the meds that you're on? Um, they're helping really uh, recommend certain uh, products that are going to target the symptoms that you're looking for. Uh, give, having a medical card also allows you um, a wider access to a wider inventory, so you have access to products that have more of the minor cannabinoids available. So, unfortunately, the recreational market is really created for just that, right? For recreational purposes, and so the products on the recreational side tend to be relatively high THC with very little focus on the minor <coughs> cannabinoids. Like I touched on, you know, the CBD, CBN, CBG, all of those components are really what's responsible for the therapeutic kind of effects that, that we see. Um, and, and the recreational side really focuses on THC mostly. So if you're looking to, you know, just chill out on a Saturday night, sure, go for the recreational product. But if you're hoping to, um, you know, get a handle on your pain or, or insomnia or some of these other symptoms, that's really where um, exploring the products on the medical side is, is a lot more beneficial. The other thing, too, is um, with your medical card, the products not only cost less, but you're not taxed on them at all because it's a medication. Um, when you're buying products on the recreational side, you're paying up to 23% sales tax on every purchase, <coughs> which is quite high. Um, all, cash. all cash, all cash. Yep. So, um, so the the follow up question that someone else asked in the front. Um, unfortunately, none of this is covered by insurance because cannabis is federally illegal, and most of the um, or generally all of the um, like private insurance companies do what CMS. Um, recommends or the Center for Medicaid um, and Medicare Services um, is recommending and so um, you know Medicare Medicaid they are a federal entity and because cannabis is federally illegal it's it's not going to be covered anytime soon it's it's you know um, even the medical visits that pertain to cannabis only so you know we have patients call our practice sometimes that say oh you charge you know a hundred dollars for a med card renewal but I, I saw this woman who takes my insurance you know she's down the street I'm like that's fraud <laughs> because um, you know I, I even consulted with um, with attorneys who basically the way that they they describe it is these visits, these, these clinicians are getting away with billing insurance because they're billing this as a general follow-up visit. So, so because the insurance isn't auditing these charts per se, they're not seeing that that wasn't a follow-up visit. That visit was solely for evaluating this person for a medical cannabis card. And if they knew that that visit was cannabis related or that was the primary purpose of the visit, they would not be covering it. So just to kind of make sure that we're staying out of hot water, we've chosen to you know have a cash pay practice with that being said our prices are very competitive and we offer like uh, a, um, a really um, I would say comprehensive and, and really um, educational experience as part of our visit I think um, like I said it, it really pains me to hear that people have had their card for five six eight, nine years and still have no idea what CBD versus THC is. You know, they're spending all this money at the dispensary and not getting the effect that they, that they really were hoping for. Yes? Yes. 
also it's reducing one's perception of pain. And um, and I it's it's interesting because when they look at the effect of cannabis on the actual pain receptors in the body, so um, the the our own opioid receptors are really um, responsible for they play a big role in how we perceive pain and, and kind of the level of, of pain that we would describe. And so when when scientists have looked at um, the pain receptors at the site of the pain, let's say you have chronic low back pain, they've looked at the pain receptors in that area before using cannabis and after using cannabis and found that there's really not much of a difference. But somehow patients are reporting, my pain level was a nine out of 10 before I use this, an hour, an hour and a half later, it's now a four out of 10 and I can, I can you know, get up and walk around and function like I wasn't able to. So for some reason, it's not that it necessarily has a pain relieving effect at the site of where the pain is happening, but for whatever reason, it, it kind of um, it kind of increases your pain threshold or your pain tolerability, where it's it's just it's more tolerable and you're able to kind of go on about your day. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So um, so THC tetrahydrocannabinol, the the molecular structure is delta nine THC, and so uh, that's that's just synonymous. You know, delta nine is the active ingredient in any sort of THC containing substance. Delta eight has essentially had one part of the molecule removed, and it's a synthetic form of cannabis. Where that can be dangerous is um, it actually um, it. Because it's, it's, your body recognizes it as a foreign substance, you can get into trouble with actually experiencing things like respiratory depression and, um, and even temperature dysregulation. So I know um, several years ago there was that incident um, in New Haven where people uh, in, in the park there on the green, like I think um, overdosed on K2. It was a Delta 8 derivative with like bath salts and something crazy. But a lot of those people were hospitalized for hypothermia because their body was not able to regulate, regulate its temperature because basically this delta A kind of um, tricked your body into not um, not responding appropriately to kind of the temperature stimuli and so I really recommend staying away from delta eight products because they're they're synthetic and they're not going to give you the same kind of therapeutic effect that we see with THC based products yes if you're taking a bunch of medication for a condition and kind of doctors throwing things at you and you kind of get it under control but like to try cannabis as opposed to solely medication. How would you like try that and then figure out which other drugs you get rid of and how mm -hmm. would you yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question is, um, if, if someone's interested in trying cannabis for a condition, but they're on a myriad of different you know, medications for that condition already, how would we go about reducing um, their medication regimen or, or kind of um, changing that up? And um, it really depends on kind of, A, the um, the goal of the treatment. So for example, if it's pain management and someone's on a pain medication, a muscle relaxant, an anti-inflammatory, I usually will kind of dose reduce maybe one medication at a time to see how the person does. Now if, there, if, if someone is on something like um, an opioid containing medication, a narcotic, um, I usually, you know, once we titrate the um, the cannabis to to an appropriate dose, so even even on like one milligram of THC nightly, oftentimes we can reduce the the uh, morphine equivalent or or you know the, the narcotic medication by about 10% and and continue to reduce that gradually. So um, that's where I really think uh, working with someone who's well versed in cannabis medicine and has been able to titrate people down from their medication regimen is so important. Um, a lot of the uh, different like webinars and podcasts and things that I listen to on cannabis medicine, they'll, uh, or, or just cannabis in general, they'll say, um, you know, but do this under the guidance of a trusted physician or do this under the guidance of an experienced physician who knows about cannabis. And I'm like, but those are so hard to find, right? Because um, we have so many wonderful experienced physicians, um, you know, even in this local community, but unfortunately many of them don't know half of what you now know today as a result of this presentation. So, yes. Uh, a question and a couple of comments. So uh, you suggested that Russo theorized um, that some deficits of our own cannabinoid system uh, may be responsible for some neuropathies. Um, are you implying, or is he implying, that uh, we could actually measure our cannabinoid level of different components in our body and actually see what we may or may not be deficient in? 
Yes, exactly. So, um, so there was a study where they looked at um, PTSD war veterans, and they looked at their levels of anandamide, which anandamide is an endocannabinoid, um, so like I said, a cannabinoid made by our own bodies that uh, is, is uh, kind of coined or, or known as the bliss molecule, the happiness molecule. And so they found that these PTSD um, or these war veterans suffering from PTSD had very low levels of anandamide. And by treating them with cannabis medicine over a period of, I think, three to six months, they found that those levels of anandamide increased and, and there was a correlative effect between the increase in anandamide levels and a reduction of their PTSD symptoms. Um, I don't think as, as far as like measuring all the endocannabinoid levels in the body, I don't think we're there yet. Like this is still such a new science, and we're learning every day, you know, um, kind of how how this works in the body. But um, but at the very least, I know that they were able to measure that endocannabinoid in the body. Um, but I think you know they're really the clinical evidence as far as measuring our own cannabinoids in the body is still very limited. Mm -hmm. and, and just a comment about safety. You know, you talked about the timeline and the use of cannabis, I mean, at one time, radium was widely utilized by physicians to treat all sorts of ailments, and science and medicine proved that, you know, for over 30, 40 years, and science proved otherwise. Um, and then lastly, being part of the EMS system, um, since legalization of cannabis, the National Poison Control Center went from receiving a couple hundred calls a year to over 7,000 calls of children ingesting um, edibles um, as of January this year, about 25% of those or more required hospitalization. Yeah. And so it's something that, like any other medicine, you need to respect and, and just not Absolutely. leave out. And you know, because it's edible, they're yeah. going to be more susceptible that people not realize what they might actually Absolutely. I think that's a great point, especially because uh, some of these, you know, um, cannabis products are made into like gummies and lollipops and candy that really could look very appealing to children. I think that's an excellent point to make. I think um, when, when uh, I hear objections like that, my, my initial response is this really comes down to we need people to be accountable for the medication that they have in their home, just like you know, you, you wouldn't keep alcohol out for children to have access to. Or, you know, if you're on pain medications, you're not going to leave your Percocet out for, for kids or animals or, or elderly people to, to get into. And it really um, comes down to the consumer or the patient. They need to be responsible and, and lock it away and keep it in an area where it's not accessible. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on that. Yes? How do you adjust your recommendations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so the question was um, uh, how I um, would dose or, or kind of, um, you know, uh, make my recommendations as far as dosing based on body mass, age. And um, interestingly enough, body mass has very little to do with it. So, uh, you know, in medicine, oftentimes medications are... Uh, are uh, dosed based on weight. When it comes to cannabis, I have seen, um, and, and this is kind of uh, documented in, in a lot of the uh, literature with cannabis, it really comes down to endocannabinoid tone or how kind of deficient or, or, or um, you know, or healthy your endocannabinoid tone is, your endocannabinoid system. And so I've had patients, I had, you know, an 80 pound, 80 year old woman who after 10 milligrams of THC didn't feel anything, we needed to increase her to 15 milligrams of THC nightly, whereas I had a 300, you know, 300 pound, like big biker dude who on two milligrams of THC was sleep, was out like a light despite years of insomnia. So it really, like the, the body mass and, and weight and age doesn't necessarily play that much of a role. I think, um, you know, to your point, kidney function and liver function certainly play a role. So if someone has liver disease or kidney disease and we worry that maybe THC would kind of build up in the bloodstream, I would dose them. I would be even more conservative with my dosing of the THC regimen, but, um, but body mass and weight really doesn't, doesn't have much to do with it, which I just start everyone on a very low dose. Yes? Um, I'll piggyback on that question. Um, are there standards that you and other people who prescribe um, medical marijuana cannabis start, um, that, like if I were to come in and some other person would say no, that uh, same sort of background, et cetera, we would be given the same regimen. Or, you know, if I came from, you know, to 
your place or a commission place in Vermont? Mm -hmm. Is there a standard? Um, that's a great question. So the question is um, whether there are kind of standard clinical guidelines or, um, or, or um, you know, any kind of standards that we go by. Is it going to be consistent if, if this patient sees me here versus seeing a medical cannabis clinician in another, in another state? And, um, you know, to, to be honest with you, the way that, that the law is kind of set up in Connecticut and many other states, I'm actually technically as a medical provider not supposed to give dosing recommendations when it comes to cannabis. Those recommendations should be coming from the pharmacist in the dispensary. And I think that's, it's just written that way, more so to protect medical providers because we are recommending a substance that's federally illegal, we are not actually prescribing it. And um, the reason that I and many medical providers who specialize in cannabis have kind of gone against that, despite it maybe not being the best legal decision on my end, is I have, I have seen so many patients who just don't get the guidance that they should from the dispensary pharmacist. It all looks great on paper. When Alicia and I have gone to national medical cannabis science conferences, many of them say, oh, the, the medical uh, cannabis program in Connecticut is excellent. You have a experienced pharmacist at every dispensary who's guiding the patient's regimen. Unfortunately, oftentimes that's really not happening, and that's where I myself as a medical provider had to step in and say, I want to learn more about this and actually follow, um, you know, guidelines and kind of parameters set forth by these other medical providers who have paved the way and who have really been involved in the research in medical cannabis. So someone like Dr. Dustin Sulak, um, based out of Maine. But you know, when it comes to dosing regimens, even between dispensaries, like if you if you go to a dispensary and you meet with a pharmacist who's been in the industry for 10 years and is really uh, very well versed in cannabis medicine, the regimen that they give you is going to be far more effective for you versus the regimen of this pharmacist who just quit their job at CVS last week and you know maybe did a whatever 24 hour course on medical cannabis as part of their onboarding right and so it really it's it's so dependent I think um, you're gonna get unfortunately a different experience depending on what clinician you go to there are some guidelines set forth for example by the um, American Cannabis Nurses Association the um, Society of Cannabis Clinicians there are guideline documents that kind of state you know for these conditions this is a good kind of starting dose of like THC or CBD and so that's um, primarily what I use to kind of guide my practice, but even that, it's not, it's not standardized, it's not across the board. Yeah. What's that? Okay. Um, I'm happy to leave my email if anyone has any follow-up questions or, or anything like that. Um, I don't know if it's on here, but I'm happy to add it. Oh, there's, there's cards in the front here, so our phone number's on there. Um, uh, my email address is Paulina DNP at HireMed.org. Um, you're you're more than welcome to email me with any comments or questions, and I, I can get back to you with uh, the responses, clinical resources, anything like that. Um, but yeah, we have our cards and our brochures here on the table. If if you have any follow up questions or are interested in learning more about our clinic, and thank you again for coming out. Um, I know that was a lot of content to cover in one night, but I'm so glad you all made it out here tonight. mumbling over my words and my hand was shaking with the paper, but I think over time it's like, it's gotten, yeah. yeah. yeah.